name is Lou Gates, and I am the originator of this exhibit, which is called Woody is Just Woody, and that is a statement by John Steinbeck. In fact, John said, uh, Woody is just Woody. Thousands of people don't know he has any other name. He is just a voice and a guitar. He sings the songs of the people, and I suspect that he is, in a way, that people. Harsh voice and nasal, his guitar hanging like a tire iron on a rusty rim. There is nothing sweet about Woody, and something more important to those who still listen. There is the will of a people to endure and a fight and fight oppression. I think we call this the American spirit. This project was put together by uh, our photographer Susan Brown and Lee Wallace, who is our two-dimensional artist who provided ink wash uh, drawings for the exhibit, and then um, memorabilia that came from the archives of the Steinbeck Center and the Woody Guthrie Center, and now we've added some things from the Walter Stern Museum here at CSU, uh, CSUB. Um, so we'll begin over here. The exhibit connects John Steinbeck with Woody Guthrie. And while I knew that years ago, I didn't know exactly what the connections were, and I think most people don't. So uh, we start really with Dorothea Lang. Dorothea Lang shot this image as well as some others of the migrant mother. This is probably the best known photograph taken by anyone. She was uh, on a team working for the FSA to shoot the migrant camps up and down California. And what she did was hire this man, Tom Collins, to be her guide. Tom Collins was the manager of the Arden camp, which was called Weed Patch in the, uh, the book, The Grace of Wrath. And that's what this whole exhibit is really linked to, is the book, The Grace of Wrath. Uh, Tom Collins helped Dorothea uh, create her images. And then John Steinbeck, about that time, was writing articles for the San Francisco News called the uh, Harvest Gypsies, and he wrote eight weekly stories about it. Seven of them were published by the San Francisco News. And then after he was uh, finished publishing those, a small organization called the Lubin Society, who was helping raise money for the migrants, contacted him and asked if they could print all eight of, of his in a pamphlet that they would sell and raise money for. Well, then they also contacted Dorothea Lang and asked her if they could use her image. So the uh, this image here, which is called Their Blood is Strong, that's the pamphlet that linked John to Dorothea. Uh, several decades later, John wrote a letter to Dorothea Lang, which is this one up here. It says, thank you, dear Dorothea, thank you for sending the picture. Nothing was ever taken that so illustrated that time. A strange time, but surely no more paradoxical than the present. We have lived in the greatest of all periods. If the question was asked, if you could choose out of all times, when would you elect to have lived? I would surely say the present. Of course, we don't know how it comes out. No one ever does. The story ends only in fiction, and I have made sure that it never ends in my fiction. There have been many great ones in my time, and I have been privileged to know some of them, but surely you are among the giants. And if I, who am not religious, offer my prayers for you, it is because God did not beget prayers. Prayers created the gods, and kept them in, in their places, too. Bless you, and thank you again for remembering affectionately John Steinbeck. And that was written in July of 1965. 
obviously many years after the pamphlet was created, which was in 1939. Uh, this is an, a, an article reprint uh, from the Mercury Herald, uh, and this is dated January 8, 1938, and it says, Oklahomans Steinbeck's Theme. John originally intended for the book to be titled The Oklahomans. Well, his wife Carol uh, typed his uh, books and edited them, and she was pretty emphatic that he should not use the title The Oklahomans for obvious public uh, uh, PR purposes, that it would be a problem as well as, as political. So, she came up with the title, The Grapes of Wrath, which comes from the Bible and also the Battle Hymn of the Republic. So in his um, opening, he dedicates the book to Carol who willed it and to Tom who lived it. Now, most people who read the book think that that was Tom Joad. Tom Joad was not a real person. Um, but it was actually Tom Collins who lived the story of the Grapes of Wrath. John uh, hired Tom Collins to be his advisor for the book when he, or the stories, when he wrote those. They, they were called The Harvest Gypsies, and then later a, a book was published about them, uh, titled that. And, um, and then he, he also hired him to be his advisor for writing of wrath. Uh, Tom Collins kept daily journals and then once a month sent those journals in so that the FSA would know what was going on in the migrant camps. Uh, this is just a short note from John to Tom and instead it says, Dear Tom, instead of the ship we're moving about in the car, then we can keep a jump ahead of anything. On a ship we would, we would lie there and have no escape, but we drive and stop and drive and stop, and this is a beautiful country, and neither of us have, has ever seen it before by John. Uh, they had spent time on a, a ship, um, so this was uh, a note to Tom that it wasn't that they weren't there any longer. In 1936, John wrote uh, a book titled In Dubious Battle. Um, three years before he, he, he uh, completed Graves of Wrath. And <clears throat> this was uh, about the battles between the migrant workers who wanted to unionize and the farmers uh, who obviously didn't want them to unionize. There was some terrific battles in the, in the Central Valley and uh, one in uh, particular, there was um, four migrants killed and eight more hospitalized from that battle. So it was, he already had a background going into the Grapes of Wrath and, and had experienced a lot of other stories himself. This is my sculpture of John and uh, most people think of John as a cigarette smoker, which he was, but in his casual time when he was relaxing and thinking, uh, he more often smoked a pipe. Uh, this is one of Lee Wallace's um, ink wash drawings, and this one's titled The Dust Bury Everything. Really, when, when uh, the dust bowl came, Many of you know the stories of, of the Dust Bowl. It would wipe out farms. They didn't have much to lose anyway. Um, the soil was mostly gone, and what was left was dust, and that just kept rolling from Texas north. Um, and so the many of the farms who were left just abandoned when, when, they, when the migrants uh, headed west. This uh, image uh, by Susan Brown is titled Solitary Reckoning. And during the 30s, the standard size plug size was two and three quarter inches by four and a quarter inches.
inches and one inch thick, and they either smoked the meat, cut blood, and they would roll their own cigarettes, or they would chew it. Those uh, sold for, at that time, um, about uh, a dime. Uh, five cents for the smaller packages and a dime for the larger packages. This um, image here, or this plaque, says almost everything about our exhibit. And it uh, came much later than, than, uh, than when we had created the exhibit, but it was given to me by the Oklahoma Historical Society after they had um, featured at a Woody Guthrie exhibit in, in Oklahoma City. And it says, on March 3rd, 1940, Will Gear hosted a Grapes of Wrath evening to benefit the John Steinbeck Committee for Agricultural Workers. The show would be remembered as the first of four folk music recital. When his cue came, Woody strolled onto the stage in his signature, just happened to be passive through style, delivered a line about how pleased he was to be playing at a Grapes of Graft show, tilted up his chin, leaned into his guitar, and began to sing. His, his voice bit at, at the heart, a low, harsh voice with velvet at the edges, the syllables beautifully enunciated. The familiar southwestern drawl was there, and the pauses, but the pauses were loaded with irony, and the drawl had a cutting edge. As he sang his famous Oki ballads, a theater scene filled with the presence of Woody's southwestern kin. He made us see the people he spoke of and his rawhide wit lashed us into laughter. Now that is a quote from Alan Lomax, who, who was the director of the Archives of American Music Library of Congress. He was known um, also, his uh, John his father, John, and Alan, the son, were the first people to go out into the field and record folk musicians who had, had never been recorded before, and also blues musicians. Uh, and that included Red Belly and Woody Guthrie and um, Muddy Waters and many other people that we know today. Ellen Lomax also sang and, and performed with, with Woody. And this, the bottom section of this says that the show changed the course of Woody's career and perhaps of American music. And then this section is actually the exact same thing that I read to you in the beginning. And again, this plaque came after we were already finished with our exhibit. Uh, so we were happy to include it. This is the, um, a replica of the poster that, or the flyer that was handed out for the Grapes of Wrath evening. It was held in 1940, and it was for the benefit of the John Steinbeck Committee for Agricultural Workers. And John was trying to raise money for the migrants. John was living in uh, Los Angeles at that time, uh, while they were filming one of his books, and uh, he met uh, Will Gear. Will Gear was an actor. You may know him as Grandpa Walton from the, the TV series The Waltons. And uh, Will Gear had Will Gear was one of the blacklisted people during. The and he he had starred in a film with Robert Redford called Jeremiah Johnson, and that paid him enough that he could buy some land in L.A. in Topanga Canyon. And he started a an outdoor theater there for the uh, specific reason of um, allowing his blacklisted friends to have a, a venue sent by Will's daughter, Ellen Gear, who was also a film and stage actress and, and also director and writer. 
Next year will be their 50th year. So this talks about the performers that will, this is, is Will Beer here, that Will brought in, which is Will, Alan Lomax, Red Belly, Woody Guthrie, and others. So Alan Lomax was the person that, that uh, created the uh, archives of American music for the Library of Congress. And then Lead Belly and Woody Guthrie. We'll talk more about Lead Belly in, in a moment. Will read excerpts from um, Will Gear's book and sang, uh, had songs in it as well. Um, Will Gear had a house on the same property as the theater. The theater was is titled the Theatricum Botanicum, and it's called that because Will had a master's degree from the University of Chicago in botany. And if you've seen the TV series, Will actually planted that garden that he took care of regularly in the, on the series. Um, moving on, this is again one of Lee's works and it is called Left Behind. And people would just have to leave and abandon their property and over time they would obviously just disintegrate. This is one of my bar releases and it's called A Long Way to Eden. And if you notice there's a little turtle here which I'll, I'll talk about in a moment. This particular photo is called Toys Left Behind. And this is a toy that the uh, photographer's grandmother had, and it was from the 20s, and this is a girl's toy washing machine. And in researching it a bit, there's one more part missing to it that, that would have been there when it was new. But this one was obviously left behind, along with the jacks. I like this connection. This is one of the National Archive images, and it's title on the road. And <clears throat> the vehicles broke down regularly. There is, <coughs> there are stories about people that would would be in these vehicles, and they would be repairing tires at, as often as fourteen times a day. And that's because the tires were bad, the roads were bad, and the vehicles were all overloaded. So you can see that there's two men down here, maybe even three, that are changing a flat. Uh, there's stories about them having to repair flats as many as 14 times a day. And that's what these men are, are doing down here. And you can see that the wheels are, are off the vehicle. You can also see that it is greatly overloaded. There's no room for towing, so it's a nice contrast here. This item and this item are, are both originals from about 1940, and they deal with the relationship or the battles between the farm workers and the farmers. The farmers, are, again, obviously didn't want unions, and the farm workers did want unions, and there's a lot of advertising that was really a lie to the migrants. They were told that there was plenty of jobs available. When they arrived in California, they found out that there was a lot fewer jobs than, than, than um, they were told. And that drove down the daily wages for the workers to a point that they that even with what they could earn when they worked, it wasn't enough to even buy food. Uh, <clears throat> Woody Guthrie was born in 1912. He died at age uh, 55, and he was diagnosed when he was 47 years old with Huntington's chorea, and he went downhill slowly over those years. In, in his, his final years, he spent most of, of the time in a hospital in New Jersey where he eventually died. This is a little item that uh, this is a letter that he wrote to Alan Lomax, the gentleman that we talked about earlier, and it really gives you a flavor of how he talked. He 
he was more educated than he wanted people to know. He wanted to relate to the migrant workers and the poor folk. And uh, uh, he did that through his music and the way that he dressed and talked. And uh, uh, that uh, was well liked by many people who followed him closely, in, including Bob Dylan later. <coughs> um, Woody knew about the Grapes of Wrath movie coming out, and he saw the movie before he read the book, but he was so influenced by it that he wrote music for two albums, and then they were later put together by Folkways Records, and, and it was called Dust Bowl ballad sung by Woody Guthrie, so that was two albums that were combined. Folkways is part of the National Archives uh, now. So, um, the Grapes of Wrath book starts <clears throat> with Tom Joad being in prison thinking about what he's going to do when he gets out. And so this is called Tom Joad Thinking. And it's an inkwash and a drum. And the first person that he met when he came out was Jim Casey, who we'll talk about. In chapter three of the book, John talks about the turtle. And the turtle symbolizes um, that a character who carried everything on his back, his whole living uh, household, was with him. And it was a challenge. He headed west all the time. But he was narrowly um, missed being run over one time someone tried to. And, uh, but he kept going. So that's the turtle here and the little turtle over here in my piece. This one's called Danger No Trespassing. And what it does is symbolize the relationship of Woody Guthrie, who rode the rails and lived with the poor folk and lived in camp in uh, railroad camps. It also connects him with Bob Dylan, who later wanted to experience everything that Woody Guthrie did, and so he rode the rails for a period of time. This one is uh, Danger, No Trespassing, Keep Off the Bridge, and it's BNSF, which is going to Northern Santa Fe. This is about a 1950s sign, so it's not quite the same vintage as the others, but it was symbolic of the railway. Uh, throughout the book, Ma talked about, Ma Jo talked about coming to California to the Emerald Valley, and all she wanted when she got there was a little white house. So this one's called Ma Dreamed of, Ma Dreamed of a Little White House. This series is a magazine that I found that was uh, the first magazine to mention anything about the, the book, The Grapes of Wrath. And it was published in 1939, August 25th, 1939, in Look Magazine. And it talks about America's own refugees. That may sound familiar to, to you to today as well. And then why John Steinbeck wrote The Grapes of Wrath. And then California's answer to it which is California's answer to the grapes of wrath, and their image that they're showing is these nice migrant camps that are nice and clean and, and healthy and they have housing available, and most of that was just simply not true. This is Jim Casey. When, when Jim Casey came out, or, or was first introduced in the book, and he met Tom Joe. Jim, Jim Casey had been a preacher, and he left the church. He was being challenged constantly with his, his own spirituality, which, by the way, John Steinbeck, throughout his life, was also raised in the church and then later dealt with his issues of his own spirituality. John also used uh, symbols in, in many of his books. He would use stories from the Bible, in the book, The East of, of Eden, he had stories about Cain and Abel, and he would have the good people all have first uh, their the initials of their 
first names would represent whether they were the good or the evil. Henry Fonda played Tom Joe from the movie, and he was really the appropriate person to do it. He was raised on a small farm in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, his family lost their farm, so he had first hand knowledge of one of the best buildings at that point in the defense, time period. Also, the Depression coincided with the best place, so they were really heavy for him. Um, he was nominated for an Academy Award. Jake Darnell, who was who played Macho, uh, was nominated and won an Academy Award. John uh, was given a Pulitzer Prize for his work, and then, of course, later on, John was also given a you know, Gold Prize. Uh, this is a recording where uh, Henry Fonda reads from the book, so it's from the book. These are some first uh, first day of our issue on the books that represents this top one is with Woody and Lidbelly. These are folk musicians. Uh, this one is from Tampa, Texas Station. The Guthrie family moved from Akima, Oklahoma, where he was born, to Texas. And, and then from there, uh, Woody kind of traveled around the country. Woody painted his way by painting signs and did a lot of, of artwork, daily, he would journal images that have since been put into books and published by the Guthrie uh, Publishing. This one is first day of uh, issue for positions. This is nineteen ninety eight. And then this one's from Okima, which they have known with on a Woody Stop Station. This is day labor filling holes. <coughs> when they arrived in in California, the migrants would do any kind of work that they could find uh, after they they realized that uh, picking produce wouldn't pay for them. So they could do whatever they could do. This top one is day laborers, and then this is one of my volumes, and this one says looking for a job, and the sign says pickers want an investor. And what that, that uh, symbolizes is that if they saw a man for a job, up and down the Central Valley. They would hitchhike or, or hop a train or, or if they had a vehicle that still worked, they would try. This is the Emerald Valley that Ma Joe talked about. Most people thought that it was probably the Central Valley because they were first arriving in the Central Valley. But in fact, the Emerald Valley was John's home, which is the Salinas home. This was called Brother Can You Spare a Dime? And a dime today, by the way, not counting any numismatic value, is worth about a dollar seventy-five. So it's about one hundred and seventy-five dollars. So it was worth that. This is called Laundry Day at the Road Camp. And if you notice, there's a um, washboard in this, which we represent in our over here in the case that, that we have some original musical instruments that would have been carried with them. This is a 1920s auto heart. This is a period washboard, uh, a jaw harp, uh, an ocarina. This particular ocarina is probably late 40s, maybe 1950. And then Marine Band Harmonica. Marine Band Harmonicas have been around since about 1890, and they were the standard of the industry. This one represents spoons, and of course, at that time, they would use spoons. This particular one is a new version and of an Irish spoon. And a lot of these people were, were Irish, Scots-Irish, and they would have carried something similar to that. The other items here in the case this is a Bound for Glory book, which is written by Woody. He also wrote Seeds of Man. Bound for Glory was later then uh, turned into a uh, movie. Um, this is a first edition Grapes of Wrath and the first edition Grapes of Wrath um, modern library book, 1939. Uh, 
Uh, this is a, an example of instruments. This is from a Sears catalog uh, of late 1920s, early 1930s. And you can see some of the prices. You can buy a, an arch top guitar for $4.95. Uh, you can buy GoPro style guitars for $24. So prices have certainly changed. But even at that time, those were very high prices and most people could not afford them. So if they had a fiddle or something that was in the family, it would be passed down to many generations. These folks over here were really important to Woody Guthrie. This is Pete Seeger. Pete Seeger was known as the, or is known as the father of, of folk music, which is kind of interesting because Woody's also known as the father of Focus. They happen to be very uh, close friends. Um, in fact, when he lived with the um, with Pete's family for a while, when he also lived with Leadbelly's family when when he first went to New York, and uh, uh, so he was very close there. Um, Pete stayed very close to the family throughout his life. Pete uh, actually taught Arlo to play guitar. This is a poster that is a uh, concert poster that was actually created for a film, a documentary film about Pete Seeger. that includes Joan Baez, Arlo Guthrie, Madeline Lanes. If you don't know that name, she's the lead singer for the Chicks, or the Dixie Chicks, Peter Paul and Mary, and Bruce Springsteen. Again, this is 1970, so these people were much younger at that time. The license plates, by the way, represent the states where um, the migrants, most of the migrants, uh, traveled from. And they they would start in Illinois. Some of them um, were as far north as Illinois, Missouri, Kansas, Oklahoma. Uh, Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and California. And these are, I think the oldest ones about 1925, and the newest ones, 1940, after the This is a, a CD of Woody's Dust Bowl music. And then this one is a tri tribute to Woody and Leadville. And they perform a lot today. This is a statement by President Obama on the passing of Pete Seeger, and he, he called him America's Tomb Boy. This was uh, Woody's earliest band, and was actually started by Pete Seeger, and this is Woody over here. There was four people in, in that group, and it started in 1940, and then it ended in 1943 when Pete was drafted. And then two years later, uh, he tried to start the band up again, but they were mostly doing other things. He did start another group called the Weavers, which did include some of, of these same um, musicians, which is Pete Singer, Lee Hayes, Ronnie Gilbert, who's the woman here, and, and Fred Kellerman. So the Weavers had several number one tunes. Uh, some of them written by uh, by Woody. This is a tribute concert that was done in, in uh, Carnegie Hall that includes Pete Singer and Arlo, I'm sorry, Bob Dylan, Arlo, and Gene Collins. And uh, again, um, Pete Singer was, was really important to the Guthrie family. I didn't show you this earlier, but this is my sculpture of the migrant mother and child taken after Dorothea Lange's image. These are items from the Leo Hart uh, collection. Leo Hart started the Sunset School in uh, Arvin, also known as Wheat Path School from uh, Dunstein, but these are, are some great original images from their collection here at CSU. On this wall, we move over to more contemporary time. Starting down here in 1970 with a tribute of 
Times. This is taken from the uh, LA Free Press newspaper, uh, September 18, 1970. And it includes Pete Seeger, Arlo Guthrie, Richie Havens, uh, Joe McDonald, who at that time was called Country Joe McDonald. You may know him as Country Joe and the Fish. Uh, Joe Baez, Will Gear, who sang, uh, Odetta, who did many of uh, Lee's songs in the time. Uh, Peter Fonda, who was one of the dancers, and then Will Gear did, and he sing. This is a recording of that concert. Um, this, this is also a recording of it. The tribute concerts were done to help raise money for the family because, as you can imagine, with Woody being hospitalized uh, for over a period of about eight years, much of it in the hospital, um, they had some really high medical bills. So the tribute concerts uh, helped uh, repay some of those medical bills. This is, uh, I should start here, this is a photograph and this is one of the um, little pieces that Woody drew many years ago. And it is both if you're still around. And then Susan Brown, the photographer, found this really cool headstone. This is gone but not forgotten. This was in a, a cemetery in Southwest Missouri. <coughs> this is Bob Dylan. Again, Bob Dylan really idolized uh, Woody and in the deep. Final years of Woody's life, he found out uh, where Woody was in, in the hospital, and he would go and, and visit him, and he would do that fairly often. They would talk and sing and, and tell stories together. And then toward the very end, when Woody couldn't talk anymore, one day he, he walked in and was a part that, that he handed um, Bob Dylan that said, uh, I'm still alive. So, um, Bruce Springsteen um, was a mentee of uh, Woody also. He, he sang a lot of, of his songs, um, which connects with everything else with, that we're doing. And in the, the uh, entire exhibit was uh, inspired by a uh, thesis that, that was written by Martha Powers, now Martha Powers Carruthers, and it was titled That Little Master, and it's titled that because John uh, heard the song, Tom Joe, which is written about the story of Tom Joe and Briggs and Brown, and he said, that little master kid, if he had written the song first, it would have saved the entire novel. So, and that is a quote by Sarah Lee Guthrie, uh, Arlo's daughter and Louis' granddaughter. Springsteen uh, created an album that's called Ghost of Tom Joe. These are uh, the words to it. And this is about Tom Joe and his story of Louis He also did a uh, concert uh, or a, a recording. That is called Seeker Sessions. And he performed quite a bit with uh, Pete Seeger. This is an, an article about Bruce and Pete Seeger. This is the story about Bob Miller coming to visit really at the end. And then the post movie was written by John Steinbeck in 1967. And he wrote an appreciation of the singer songwriter, Lee Becker, who had recently died. Powerful piece of writing, and Franklin works on that nails the musician firmly into the era that both lived, they both lived through, and challenged as friends. Um, the other items up here, Joan, of course, was very connected to Bob Dylan, and um, they were, Joan really helped get Bob Dylan on stage. And um, the next one is Arlo Guthrie Alice's Restaurant, which is one of the few times, maybe the only time, that a movie was created after a song. And Arlo, Arlo had the hit song, uh, and 
it was so popular in the that they created a movie about it. If you've seen the movie, uh, Alice's Restaurant doesn't exist anymore, but they but he sang about the little church around the corner. Well, Arnold bought that church, and that's now a music venue and a small league um, museum. Brandon Jack Elliott was a friend of, of Woody's, and he, he knew him well. He sang, they sang together, and at age 85, he still is on the road, and this year has a fairly active concert program. Yeah. The broadside was an article uh, that, that came out weekly. It was published in, in Los Angeles, and, and this one talks about Woody Guthrie, man or myth, and then there's also an article about PC. That, that was published in 1960, I believe, or 66, excuse me. And then this is the final one, and this is from the 15th uh, annual Woody Guthrie Folk Festival in Okima. That, that's where Woody was born. This year, for the 25th anniversary, we were the feature of the uh, and it was a lot of fun because all of Woody's grandkids came and performed for the festival. Thank you very much for visiting us. Uh, I hope you can come and see it in 